my name is Johan Hatting. I'm the chief editor of IBFD's Bulletin for International Taxation. The journal is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year, and in December, a special issue will be published uh, in which a number of articles commissioned for this Jubilee issue uh, will appear. Um, I'm very pleased today to be with Professor Guglielmo Maestro, uh, who is the founder of Maestro and Associati in Milan, Italy. Uh, he's also a professor of tax law at the Catholic University of Milan um, and member of the Board of Trustees of IBFD and the International Fiscal Association's Vice President. Uh, so Professor Maestro has written a scholarly article on the title of Interpretation of Tax Treaties and the Decisions of Foreign Tax Courts as Subsequent Practice under Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, good afternoon, Guglielmo, and welcome to this interview. Good afternoon, and uh, uh, thank you, John, uh, for uh, inviting me at, uh, for this conversation. Uh, let me first say the reason for which I, I decided to, to write uh, a paper on this subject for the Jubilee of, uh, of a Ballet. Uh, the, the whole point is uh, that the treaties, uh, tax treaties, uh, bilateral conventions, uh, uh, have to do with uh, a common interpretation, uh, namely that uh, a treaty provision has to be ideally interpreted in the same way by both contracting states. So necessarily, uh, by way of common sense, uh, one would need uh, in interpreting uh, a treaty provision to look uh, into the other contracting state uh, uh, interpretation of a treaty, and, uh, and the interpreter would then come across uh, uh, tax uh, uh, courts uh, interpretation so that uh, foreign court decisions uh, uh, would come into play. That is by instinct uh, a common sense sort of approach which uh, uh, in international law turned into a legal interpretation based on uh, the principle of, of good faith uh, under the Vienna Convention on, uh, on treaties uh, and also, I would say, under Article 31 and 32 on the interpretation of the treaties. That is basically the uh, primary reason for which I decided to write uh, uh, on this subject. The second reason uh, uh, which is not uh, less important, uh, is that uh, in uh, 2018 uh, the International Law Commission uh, addressed uh, uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, Article 31, uh, uh, Paragraph 3 uh, of Letter A and B on uh, interpretation of, uh, of treaties. Uh, uh, and those uh, provisions uh, make reference indeed uh, also to the practice uh, of uh, uh, subsequent practice, uh, namely the practice of a contracting state after the conclusion of a treaty. And there, uh, judicial decisions uh, uh, come into play with a way fit into uh, those uh, uh, provisions of Article 31 or as a supplementary means of interpretation under Article 32 of the Vienna Convention. So basically, these are the two reasons. The first one is common interpretation, and second, the work undertaken by the International Law Commission, that after many, many years of uh, work, uh, concluded its uh, final report in 2018. Thank you, uh, Guglielmo. Uh, so your article goes into a, a lot of depth and uh, uses many interesting examples where you, through this framework of the International Law Commission, really look at two key areas uh, to establish when subsequent state practice uh, will be required um, uh, by the interpreter to, to be considered. 
And I wonder if you can talk to us about uh, one of the main ones, and that is just on the question of what is a state practice? Uh, what, what are some of the considerations uh, to establish state practice? Uh, yes, indeed, uh, the International Law Commission is uh, putting together uh, experience uh, uh, of uh, courts uh, in determining uh, what state uh, practice means. Uh, and obviously, uh, many, if not all, uh, uh, of those uh, court decisions or interpretation given by scholars uh, have to do with non tax treaties. So the difficulty that we have uh, in the context of, uh, of tax treaties is that uh, we don't have much uh, experience uh, on uh, the interpretation uh, of Article 31 and 32 uh, in the context of uh, uh, tax treaties when we, have, uh, we come to the definition of the expression state practice. So state practice uh, is uh, uh, regarded to be and to include uh, uh, competent authority uh, agreements uh, uh, based in relying on Article 25, uh, I would say Article 25, uh, Paragraph 3, on what uh, are commonly defined interpretative uh, agreements uh, between uh, the contracting uh, uh, competent authorities, and also uh, state practice includes uh, judicial decisions. Uh, that, I think, is also confirmed uh, by uh, the International Law Commission, uh, which uh, in uh, uh, the conclusions uh, which have been submitted to the Assembly of the United Nations uh, expressly say that uh, the practice, uh, the subsequent practice, uh, includes uh, any conduct by any organ of the state and specifically makes reference also to judicial bodies because under international law, the conduct of a state is the conduct which is attributable to organs of a state, which includes legislature, so legislation, parliament, it includes the executive, government, and it also includes judicial bodies. So here we have a situation where state practice includes also court decisions. So the judicial conduct, that is the practice, uh, and that practice indeed uh, might have a, a role, a, a more and more important role in uh, interpreting the tax treaties also for the other countries which uh, might uh, react or accept the judicial practice of the first state. Uh, one difficulty that uh, I came across, I'm, I'm not the only one, it has to do with uh, when a practice is solid enough, when a conduct is solid enough to represent a practice. And I would draw a distinction between a conduct and a practice. A conduct may be, if we make reference to judicial decision, one court decision is a conduct, but a practice uh, is a rep repetition of a conduct uh, a few times uh, so that it becomes uh, a really solid view on interpretation of a given uh, treaty provision. Obviously, uh, if we look at bilateral uh, tax treaties, uh, then there might be a need for a somewhat flexible interpretation of what the practice uh, is, uh, namely that uh, if we look at the conduct uh, in the sense of a judicial court decision, uh, then one would need uh, to take into consideration also court decisions uh, which have been delivered on similar provision regarding treaties concluded by a country with a third state to the extent that the wording in that treaty is very similar to the wording of the treaty was the interpretation is sought by the court. So I will make an example. 
uh, make a reference to our two countries, uh, Italy and South Africa. If I were to interpret the uh, Italy-South Africa Treaty, uh, say Article 5 on definition of permanent establishment, uh, which is a provision on which you do have and we do have, I would say, quite significant case law, uh, I would look at uh, the interpretation given by South African courts uh, in judgments uh, which necessarily, don't necessarily have to do with Italian uh, treaty, but may have been delivered in relation to precisely the same, working, the same wording with regard to other countries. So South African US treaty, South African Netherlands treaty, to the extent that the provision namely Article 5 of the CD model is precisely the same in, in both treaties, then I believe I could consider uh, such court decisions as a practice which I could use in the interpretation of the Italy-South Africa Treaty in order to reflect the practice of South Africa in relation to Article 5 of the Italy-South Africa Treaty. That is uh, basically the flexibility which is required because if I were to be restricted to look solely at the case law on the Italy-South Africa Treaty, namely only and solely on case law regarding that bilateral treaty, then uh, the situations where that is realistically possible are very, very limited because of a limited number of court decisions regarding a particular treaty. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a very good example. Um, I think your article also describes some of the challenges when you uh, are looking at, in this example, the South African cases uh, by figuring out what is the standing of the court. Uh, is there contradictions in South Africa towards the court? I, I wonder if you can explain some of those really practical uh, aspects of this investigation. Uh, thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, we are making reference to a conduct and is a conduct by court, so it's a judicial conduct. And uh, if you look in detail into uh, what is uh, a court decision uh, of another state, uh, then a number of issues do arise uh, uh, in order to establish whether uh, that conduct uh, amount to a practice, if it is a solid con uh, conduct, if it is a conclusive conduct. So the first question uh, is, uh, the first question is, is uh, the um, court which delivered the decision a, f a court of last instance? And uh, international law scholars uh, uh, give credit uh, to obviously to the fact that uh, the court decision is a final court decision. Uh, first of all because it is final and uh, that may play an even more important role in countries where court decisions are binding on other court decision. The what we call stare decisis uh, uh, principle. Uh, in other situations, uh, um, the court uh, is looked at uh, in terms of reputation of a court, uh, and uh, it's not necessarily true that a court of last instance uh, uh, is uh, the most respected court in a particular area of law. Uh, there may be uh, tax courts which are not necessarily supreme courts, uh, which have uh, a large experience uh, on tax cases uh, and also and especially on tax treaty cases. Uh, and the quality of their judgments uh, might be uh, more valuable compared to some decisions of supreme courts, which are 
maybe final uh, court decisions, but uh, uh, may have a reasoning which is less convinces, convincing because at the end, the persuasive nature of the decision is what it matters. That is at least my view. So one cannot just look at the existence of a foreign court decision. Uh, it's not a, a mechanical way of interpreting a treaty provision. I cannot say my interpretation is right because the Supreme Court of Germany decided in the same way. What is important is uh, the persuasive nature of the reasoning behind the court decision and uh, one weakness that sometimes uh, I find uh, in uh, reasoning uh, which makes reference uh, to foreign court decision is that the foreign court decision is quoted but uh, there is no further review and scrutiny of the underlying reasoning uh, which might be part uh, of what we call a sort of dialogue between the local court and the foreign court which delivered a court decision. I want to move on to the the other main requirement uh, for subsequent state practice to become uh, uh, relevant under the Vienna Convention and that is the requirement that it must establish the agreement of the parties. Uh, and in your article you seem to be a bit more skeptical and hesitant whether we might find that in the area of tax treaties. I wonder if you can tell us uh, about the reasons for your view. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, indeed, uh, the whole uh, issue is uh, related to Article 31 uh, and uh, Paragraph 3, Letter B of uh, the um, Vienna Convention, which basically includes uh, in the, the means of interpretation the subsequent practice, uh, so for instance, uh, uh, the practice of a judicial body, we could say the practice of uh, the South African Supreme Court, which constantly decided uh, uh, in interpreting Article 5 of the treaty precisely in the same way for a number of years, so no doubt that is a practice, but that is not sufficient to crystallize a means of interpretation. There is a need for the other contracting state, in our example, Italy, to have, in a way, established an agreement, in a way accepted, have shown acceptance of the view expressed by the South African judiciary. How is that possible? First of all, uh, the Article 31 makes reference to an agreement and uh, uh, the preparatory work of the Vienna Convention indicates that agreement should not be interpreted as a binding uh, uh, nature is more in terms of understanding. So a sort of ambiguous term which uh, does not amount to an agreement but is something which uh, is a, a sort of indirect acceptance of a view with the possibility to step back and change view in the future, change in the practice. Now, in order to have an agreement, in order to, in our example, to agree or to show the same understanding with the South African Supreme Court interpretation, there is a need to look at the conduct of the other state, in our example, the Italian <coughs> state. And that would be difficult. It would be difficult because especially courts, Italian courts, could not uh, make a reference uh, to their agreement uh, with regard uh, to a foreign uh, judiciary. So what we call the judicial dialogue uh, is not easy uh, because there are no mechanisms uh, in domestic uh, rules which permit a dialogue of that sort. Obviously, one way of establishing the agreement uh, so one way for a country to 
uh, express uh, the same understanding of interpretation given by foreign court could be, for instance, uh, to uh, accept the ramifications of a foreign court decisions and, for instance, grant a credit, a foreign tax credit, for the taxes levied in the source state in accordance with uh, a court decision. So, in the example we have used in this conversation, if uh, a South African court uh, were to establish that uh, a permanent establishment exists in South Africa and uh, that South African uh, corporation tax is due. And if an Italian tax authority were to accept uh, that conclusion by granting a credit for South African taxes levied <coughs> on the basis of a treaty, then one could argue if such a conduct by the Italian revenue agency were to be uh, repeated a number of times, that, that would constitute an understanding, uh, namely sharing the view of the foreign judiciary. That is one way to interpret uh, Article 31.3b. Another interesting way that uh, international law scholars have considered uh, uh, in terms of uh, establishing the agreement uh, uh, of another state practice uh, is in action. Uh, and also the International Law Commission is uh, uh, considering in action. It looks at in action uh, with uh, some caution because obviously not every in action means accepting the view of another party but it says uh, that inaction is to be considered especially when a reaction were to be expected. And uh, the question that one <coughs> would need to put would be in the tax treaty context to say if uh, the judiciary of another contracting state is taking a conduct which amount to a practice and which amount to uh, source tax being applied. Is there a reaction which we may expect from the other contracting state? So if South Africa were to constantly apply South African tax on a fixed place of business on the basis of Article 5, would there a reaction expected by the Italian, say, revenue agency and, uh, or not? Because if a reaction is expected and uh, the reaction doesn't materialize, then one could argue that uh, the inaction amounts to an agreement uh, established on the practice of the South African judicial bodies. Now, uh, obviously, it's a very delicate aspect because not every uh, court decision or judicial practice uh, uh, would necessarily require always uh, an immediate reaction, but certainly that is something that would need to be investigated with care, and that might be a subject for my next paper, namely to which extent uh, inaction by a contracting state under a treaty may be relevant uh, in terms of uh, interpretation of tax treaties in connection with the other contracting state, state practice. So that is a subject which uh, would need uh, to be considered and studied and to my knowledge uh, has not yet been explored in the tax uh, context. Yes, I, uh, I think your paper is wonderful in the sense that it's writing open a whole host of new questions for tax treaty scholars. I want to conclude by asking you about the way forward. Uh, whilst you seem to be skeptical that there's that we can easily find examples of uh, subsequent state practice consisting of foreign court decisions that will be f establish a binding agreement between the two countries, 
um, you are nevertheless quite hopeful or positive about the value of looking at foreign court decisions. I wonder if you can explain to us your views. Uh, yes, I have two, uh, uh, one uh, comment and uh, one uh, uh, recommendation or, or conclusion uh, which, which you may read in the uh, article for the bulletin. First of all, I would recommend, uh, my comment is uh, uh, on uh, the um, attention which needs to be made in reading and using a foreign court decision because of the several traps that you may find uh, on your way which leads to reading the foreign court decision, understanding the foreign court decisions and taking the benefit of the reasoning behind and included in the foreign court decisions because you necessarily need to have uh, to know well the foreign legal system or at least uh, uh, to study some of the features of the foreign legal system uh, which uh, might affect the reasoning of a foreign court. So that I think is something which uh, uh, needs to be looked at so that you cannot automatically look at a foreign court and just draw a conclusion. Every court decision requires a lot of attention, preparatory work to understand who is delivering uh, the judgment, uh, why the judgment is focusing on one particular matter, why the judgment has not addressed other issues, and then uh, you can draw a conclusion on the merit of the judgment, of the interpretation. So a lot of attention on the one hand uh, on the use of foreign court uh, decisions. That is one point. Then on how to, uh, on why uh, is important, is important to look at foreign court decisions because uh, of common interpretation. And in third point, how can we do that? Because of the very limited number of uh, situations where the judiciary of one country looks uh, at uh, foreign court decisions. How can we, in a way, impose uh, or uh, raise the point, uh, draw the attention of uh, the judiciaries uh, of uh, several countries uh, to the need to investigate into foreign case law. One way to deal with it can be drawn from experience of uh, uh, treaties in uh, the non-tax uh, uh, context and uh, in particular I have in mind uh, one treaty which is the Lugano Convention. The Lugano Convention on uh, judgments, on enforcement of judgments, has to do with, uh, contains uh, a provision in the protocol which requires uh, the uh, interpretation of the provisions of the convention to take into account, uh, to consider foreign court decisions delivered by courts of uh, other contracting states. So it's not uh, the binding uh, nature of a foreign court decision, it's the obligation to consider so that if a court of one contracting state fails to consider and to review and scrutinize a decision of given and delivered by the other contracting state judiciary, at that point that failure would basically create a right of appeal and a misinterpretation and the failure to interpret properly the tax treaty. So that uh, sort of provision, that sort of obligation included in, the, in a bilateral convention, the obligation to consider a foreign court decision might certainly help and perhaps without amending the model convention, <coughs> one could include a reference to it in the commentary so that countries might decide to include such a provision in their treaties. Thank you, Professor Maestro.
Um, there's no doubt that uh, in this quest for common tax treaty interpretation, one must be able to understand the judicial dialogue in your own country, but clearly also in other treaty partner countries, and importantly, the dialogue between judges uh, is the focus of this assessment of Professor Maestro, for which I thank him very much. He's given us a great gift in this special issue of the bulletin, and I commend this article to all readers who are interested in uh, common tax treaty interpretation. Thank you very much, Google. Thank you, Johan, uh, and congratulations again. I would say happy birthday to the bulletin for its uh, jubilee.